Okay, on behalf of the Center for Chinese Studies at UH Manoa, I would like to welcome everyone to our Spring 221 CCS seminar series. Please note that this session is being recorded and the file will be uploaded to the CCS website, the link of which you can now see in the chat forum. My name is Mingbao Yu from the Department of East Asian Languages, and I'm the organizer and moderator of this series, which we have been conducting entirely as Zoom webinars since last semester. And this would not have been possible without the formidable leadership of current CCS director, David Yang, professor of accounting from Scheidler School of Business, his hardworking and committed team of staff that includes CCS associate director, Dr. Cindy Ning, and CCS program coordinator, Ms. Jianing Sun. During the session, if you have any questions or queries about technical or logistical issues, please use the chat forum you see at the bottom of your screen that will be monitored and answered by Dr. Ning and Ms. Sun. We have an impressive lineup of presentations for this semester, and you can find our complete program flyer on the CCS website and Instagram. If you have been following our CCS webinars last semester, you probably noticed that our series is different from other seminar and speaker series on this campus because our program showcases a variety of innovative and collaborative presentation formats, including last and this semester, four co-sponsored interdisciplinary and interregional faculty panels with the Center for Southeast Asian Studies that are part of a larger research project focusing on China and its relationship with Southeast Asia. Furthermore, this semester, we are also very fortunate to have secured the participation of Chinese study scholars from locations around the world, namely California, the East Coast, Europe, and Taiwan. We began our series this semester with a presentation focusing on Taiwan's presidential election in 2020. And last week, we had our first speaker from Europe, Germany. Today, however, we are returning to familiar grounds in Hawaii and UH Manoa. Our event today is featured as an interdisciplinary faculty dialogue between Joseph Tanki, Professor of Philosophy, and Kate Lingley, Associate Professor of Art History and Chair of the Department of Art and Art History. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Philosophy and the Arts and Art History Departments for their co-sponsorship. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our speakers. Joseph Tanki earned his PhD at Boston College. He has lectured and published extensively on issues and figures in continental philosophy, aesthetics, and the history of philosophy. His major publications include Foucault's Philosophy of Art, A Genealogy of Modernity, published by Continuum in 2009, and Jacques Rancière, An Introduction, Philosophy, Politics, and Aesthetics, published by Continuum in 2011. Professor Tanki recently also completed with Colin McQuailen the Bloomsbury Anthology of Aesthetics, published by Bloomsbury 2012, which is a new textbook for use in courses dedicated to aesthetics, the philosophy of art, and literary, he literary theory. Additionally, Professor Tanki is interested in comparative aesthetics, social and political philosophy, and the historical ontology of pain within Western thought and medicine. His China experiences include a specialized graduate seminar on aesthetics offered you the summer months of 2012, 13, and 2014 at the Center for Aesthetics and Aesthetic Research at Peking University. And in 2014, he also taught at Renmin University. Professor Tanki's presentation today developed out of a keynote that he was given for the reopening of the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Kate Lingley earned her PhD degree in art history from the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on Buddhist votive sculpt uh, sculptures of the Northern and Southern dynasties period, with a particular interest in the social history of religion, of religious art. Professor Lingli has curated several exhibitions, including one on Mingqing personal adornment and one on Chinese painting and calligraphy from Honolulu collections that focused on the work of reformers of the 19th and 20th century. She's currently working on a book manuscript that explores the representation of identity in Northern Dynasties China by examining the relationship between tomb portraits and donor portraits from the same period. Professor Tanki's presentation today is entitled Brush and Ink from East to West and Back Again and takes at its point of departure 
Pan Hong Kai's recent attempts to develop a new theory of the cultural specificity, specificity of Chinese brush and ink painting. Pan Gong Kai is a contemporary Chinese painter and the current president of the China Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. Professor Tanki examines in detail Pan's claim that the development of Chinese brush and ink painting is owing to the uniqueness of literati culture. But he suggests that that culture, together with Chinese brush and ink, needs to be understood in terms of the Taoist worldview. Accordingly, Professor Tanki argues that the chief differences between classical Chinese and Western paintings are owing to the fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality. Professor Tanki will speak for 45 minutes or so, and then Professor Ling Li will provide some comments and engage him in a brief dialogue before we will launch into our Q&A session. At any time during the presentations, the audience is invited to use the Q&A forum that you see at the bottom of your screen to send your questions, which we will monitor and present to our speakers after their presentations. Please do not wait to send your questions until the very end, because then we may run out of time to answer them. In order to accommodate everyone, we kindly ask that you please keep your comments concise and ask no more than two questions, so we can keep within the 30 minutes we have allocated to this portion of our program. We will try to do our best to answer your question in the order they are submitted, but we might also synthesize or group together similar questions so then we can get a more focused response from our speakers and make room for other comments and queries. After today's presentation, we will send out a brief survey to everyone, so we would greatly appreciate if you could take a minute or two to give us some feedback. So without further ado, let me now turn over to Professor Tanki and his talk, Brush and Ink, from east to west and back again. Thank you, Ming Bao. Thank you for that really warm and generous introduction. A uh, small point of clarification, however. Um, in fact, Penguin Kai recently stepped down from the leadership at uh, Kafa and uh, it has entered into something of a retirement, if you can consider uh, retirement that he continues to develop new architectural plans, continues to paint, um, continues to write books, uh, and has a very ambitious project of trying to narrate the history of world art from a Chinese perspective. Um, and he's, he's a major figure within uh, Chinese art circles. And this paper emerges out of a dialogue with him um, and my friendship and admiration uh, for his friendship with him and my admiration for his work that's developed over the years, um, primarily through his his generous invitations to 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 come to his exhibitions um, and 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 be in dialogue with the kinds of production that he's doing. And in what follows, I'm going to suggest some of the ways in which his recent book, Pangun Kai's recent book, Brush and Ink in Chinese Painting, might form the starting point for a conversation about the differences between classical Chinese and classical Western painting. So it's important to note that I'm talking only about classical Chinese painting and classical Western painting. I'm not talking about modern painting and I won't be talking about modern aesthetics or, or really like what I would call aesthetics proper in the German tradition. Accordingly, I will use Pan's analysis of the visual or sensible differences in order to attempt in these paintings to attempt to identify the different theoretical or metaphysical frameworks which ground each practice of painting. This project entails, in the first instance, questioning whether or not the aesthetic differences that Pan describes throughout the course of his study, namely those that pertain to the illusionistic qualities of classical Western painting and the more abstracted and spiritualized presentations specific to the classical Chinese painting, are really adequately theorized by the social and psychological explanation that Pan offers. I will raise the question as to whether or not it might be better to interpret these differences in terms of two more wide ranging cosmological assumptions that separate our two cultures. Somewhat unsurprisingly, I will suggest that brush and ink is inseparable from the Taoist metaphysical framework which helped to give rise to it, and that classical Western art stems from the Aristotelian ontology that is at work in the formed matter concept of art. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean by the formed matter concept of art in a little bit. While these dis 
discussions of metaphysics may be difficult to follow, what I'm really interested in explaining is how each of these frameworks gave rise to a different sense of what creativity is. So uh, this is where I'll push this discussion is ultimately towards an account of what it means to engender a, a work of art um, from, the, from the vantage point of the two traditions. Classical, or excuse me, Chinese brush and ink painting, precisely because classical Chinese thought managed to avoid the problem of an underlying substance that would support and ground all changes, managed to situate itself on the plane of life where it could become a means of pure expression. Western philosophical thought, on the other hand, was beholden to the notion that there is a fundamental substance or substrate, what the Greeks called hypokaimenon, that underlines all, underlies all changes. And as such, classical Western painting was able to place itself outside of the world that it would then seek to represent. So those are the, the major um, metaphysical differences that I will discuss in a little bit. But first, let me talk a little bit about um, Pan's project in, in some detail. Pan Gun Kai argues that Chinese brush and ink painting constitutes a distinctive artistic language and that its meaning is largely inseparable from the culturally specific social structure in which it was developed. As is well known, brush and ink was produced by generations of Chinese literati, and as such, it requires a form of understanding that takes account of the values specific to this social class. This means that Pan's study is at once a contribution to art history, theory, and the social history of Chinese brush and ink painting a remarkable feat when one considers today's academic division of labor. According to Pan's account, Chinese brush and ink gradually moved from being a tool with which to represent objects and decorate temples during the Wei and Jin periods into a vehicle for expressing the ideal personality as it was conceived by the literati during the course of the Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties. Since its inception, Chinese brush and ink was concerned more with developing the expressive potential of the medium than with perfecting its capacities for representation. Here we can cite the Song Dynasty poet Su Shi, or Su Dong Po, who, as he's sometimes known, who, who claimed that, quote, to judge a painting in terms of its fidelity to nature is to share views close to that of a child as evidence of this artistic sensibility. Su, Su Dong Po is my favorite, uh, favorite Chinese aesthetic theorist in large part because I love the pork that carries his name that you can get around, around, around Hangzhou. This expressive tendency underwent further refinement during the Yuan dynasty when artists began attempting to express their own emotional states instead of imbuing objects with spiritual qualities. In the Yuan dynasty then, we see a subtle but nevertheless decisive shift and an important step in the development of the idea that the practice of brush and ink is in fact an essential part of the scholar's attempt to arrive at an ideal personhood. And I would like to acknowledge and thank my colleague Frank Perkins for um, talking through uh, this issue of translation about how to, how to translate this very important concept for Pangun Kai, namely this idea that um, literati painting uh, presents us with a, with with a not a representation, but uh, 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 the feeling, the sensibility of um, the literati personhood ideal or ideal of personhood. From the Song Dynasty onward, Neo Confucianism exercised an ever more profound influence over the development of Chinese culture, and for the development of brush and ink, it was the doctrine of heart mind Jin, which proved to be essential. This doctrine holds that the jin, the heart mind, is the living center of the human person, but that this faculty needs to be cultivated through both ritual and self-discipline before full virtue can be achieved. The form of literati painting that developed during the Song and Yuan dynasties was a way of both developing and expressing this personhood ideal. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, less and less mind was paid to the objects of painting and attention was instead focused on the inner life of the artist. This is the stage in the development of Chinese brush and ink that most interests Pan, as it well represents his thesis that it was brush, that it was brush and ink, that it was through brush and ink that the literati sought to convey themselves, and in particular their attempts to embody the virtues. 
Since there is no divide between heart and mind within the Neo-Confucian thought, that is no separating of the human person into rational and emotional components, it is thought that one cannot be an expert in painting without at the same time mastering the virtues of filial piety, zhao, faithfulness, jin, wisdom, zi, ritual action, li, justice, yi, and of course, ren, which I'll leave untranslated. It is important to stress, particularly for a Western audience, that Chinese brush and ink does not simply represent the values of the literati, but that it is itself the direct manifestation of them. In this way, painting is an extension, extension of the life that has already been shaped and molded. This means that for the literati who practice it, brush and ink is not separable from life. The brush's movement, the flow of the ink, these are a manifestation of the artist's basic life energy. For this reason, we should say that the work of art comes into being in unity with the art, artist's personhood ideal. This is why we can say without any hint of exaggeration that as we become more adroit at viewing and appreciating Chinese brush and ink, we feel as though we are coming into direct contact with artists long deceased. To put the point in ontological terms, Chinese brush and ink paintings are alive and are part of the world in a way that Western representational painting in as much as they are representations never could be. Let us remind ourselves of what is at stake in classical Western painting. Representation is not just an aesthetic program that prioritizes the development of illusionistic painting. It is a certain idea about the relationship between art and life, one which defines art and life as separable and distinct. And it is really not until the birth of abstract expressionism that Western painting will arrive at a notion which is similar to that of the classical Chinese, namely that the activity of painting is not just a technical enterprise, but a way of manifesting who one is. During the course of the Ming and Qing dynasties, the expressive capacity of, of brush and ink underwent a subtle but nevertheless decisive transformation. Henceforth, less attention will be paid to the object's emotional and spiritual significance. Instead, that energy comes to be invested in the artist's lived reality. Once again, however, this quote lived reality is not simply a transient emotional state, but as Pangun Kai puts it, the ideal personhood of Chinese intellectuals. The idea that brush and ink painting is a platform for developing and expressing the ideal personhood is the crux of Pangun Kai's contribution to the theorization of brush and ink. He explains that in the work of such epitomizing masters like Nizan, Badashiran, Wu Changshu, and Huang Binghong, I'm sorry for, for, for butchering these names, that quote, we can see a consistent demonstration of the doctrine of the mean, erudition, and magnanimity. Magnanimity, that is, virtues which describe the person of integrity celebrated by Chinese intellectuals. Once again, it's important to remind ourselves that we should not look for these qualities in the so-called content of the work. Rather, they are at work in the discipline and virtuosity needed for handling a brush and ink, brush and ink accordingly. One might say that painting is not just the mirror which reflects back one's character, but it, that it is the venue in which one exercises it. One of the aims of Pangun Kai's project, as we have already indicated, is to draw into relief the differences between classical Chinese brush and ink and classical Western painting. His way of summing up these differences are encapsulated in the distinction he draws between the ABC mode belonging to the Chinese artist and the DOR mode of the Western painting, Western painter, excuse me. Here, ABC designates the analogy-based conceptual mode of drawing, while the DOR describes the quote, detail-oriented representational mode. For Pan, these concepts are at once aesthetic and psychological in as much as they refer to the cognitive processes responsible for relating the artist's stroke to his glance. In drawing an object, a figure, or a landscape, the Chinese artist is guided by, by his facility with the idioms of brush and ink rather than direct observation. As such, the object comes to him through the lenses of tradition, as well as his own disposition towards the world. For the Western artist, the relationship is reversed. He calibrates his gestures by linking them to what he finds in the direct and immediate apprehension of an object. 
the ABC and the DOR mode are thus two fundamentally different ways of relating to the world and the process of fashioning an image. Sketching from life, which is typical within the Western context, but less so within the Chinese, enables the Western draftsman to gradually build up his impressions into a full-fledged image. The Chinese painter, on the other hand, relies more upon memory and mood than the object itself. In the psychological terms that Pan provides, it might even be said that for the Chinese painter, memory and mood prevail over the image since his process aims to join together a partially abstracted composition with the artist's own life force. Before concluding, I want to see to what extent it is possible to take up Pan's account of the differences between Chinese and Western painting from a cosmological or metaphysical perspective. And this will be my contribution to the conversation about these differences. My suggestion will be that the formal differences that Pan attributes to social and then psychological differences might be interpreted as stemming from deeper metaphysical commitments regarding the nature of reality which in turn structure the concept and practice of art. Talking about, quote, reality without placing that notion itself in question already threatens to bias the comparison in favor of the Western. The notion that there is a single reality which must be captured and expressed, whether in words or in painting, is a byproduct of the representational thinking that has held sway over Western thought since the time of the Greeks. In order to create a neutral ground for these two cultures to meet, we must first uncover the tacit presuppositions at work in our own thought. That is, we must identify those places where linguistic conventions and metaphysical assumptions take the place of thinking and do the thinking for us. We can be aided in this task by the pioneering work of the French philosopher and sinologist Francois Julien. Julien has done more than any philosopher since Heidegger and Foucault to identify the constitutive limitations of Western thought. In speaking of the quote, constitutive limitations of Western thought, I mean, of course, those fundamental assumptions which define the Western philosophical tradition in its specificity, but which prevent it from posing certain questions or developing other directions. Julien has sought to accomplish his analysis of these constitutive limitations by means of a celebrated quote detour through Chinese literature and philosophy. This detour aims to fecund Western thought by opening it up to some of the conceptual resources found within the richness of the Chinese language. One virtue of this project is that it allows us Westerners to look upon our own tradition from the outside or as if we were encountering another culture for the first time. In short, it renders our own philosophical assumptions strange and in so doing prepares the ground for a new way of thinking that may yet come to circulate between the two cultures. Julian reminds us that, that Western thought has for centuries been enthralled by a hypothesized conception of being. That is, the Western philosophical tradition has tended to make being with a capital B or reality with capital R, it matters little what one calls it, into a distinct pre-existing subject, substance. The concept of being that one finds in the text of philosophy was in fact prepared for it by the assumptions that are at work in the ancient Greek language. These linguistic commitments are clarified when one compares the classical Chinese with the classical Greek, thereby discovering that the former language possesses no single verb for to be, but signifies the existence of something by joining together there is with the copula. It is not difficult to see why these two different linguistic starting points gave rise to two fundamentally distinctive points of view about the nature of being or reality, and those notions are here under erasure. On the basis of the resources contained within the ancient Greek language, Western thought was constrained in its treatment of being and condemned to think being as a single underlying reality, which it is the duty of Western metaphysics to represent faithfully. This way of conceptualizing being is what Heidegger described as ontotheology, and the fateful step to which he attributed the forgetting of the question of being. This ontotheology, Heidegger thinks, is what leads Western thought to think being in terms of beings or entities, or said differently, to treat being itself as an entity or a being. Classical Chinese thought, on the other hand, sidesteps the problem of being entirely. Instead, Chinese thought regards nature, 
not reality or being here, as a never ending series of processes, transformations, or way makings, to cite my colleague Roger Ames's preferred translation of the Tao. By articulating itself in terms of an underlying substance, hypokaimanon, one which is supposed to support and thereby ground all changes, Western thought committed itself very early in its history to the principle of identity, its corollary, the principle of non contradiction and the law of the excluded middle, the principle which holds that for any proposition, only that proposition or its negation is true. It has since become impossible to imagine Western philosophy without these three principles. Taoist thought, by way of contrast, unfolded not as an effort to think a single underlying identity or reality, but through the development of a complementary dyad, that of the yin and the yang. From the Western perspective, this approach is fated to appear as either contradictory, irrational, or simply mystical when translated back directly back into Western terms. However, as we work our way back to a more neutral cultural position, one in which the question of ultimate reality is not already tilted in favor of the Western notion of reality, we might rid our thought of the unthought that shadows it and thus prepare the space for a thought that is free. And the way in which we do this is by attending to all the ways in which our languages silently but firmly bias our thought in one direction. Only in this way might we do justice to a heterogeneous form of logic that is at work in the Book of Changes, a logic which today, from the vantage point of Western thought, one might be tempted to describe as deconstructive in as much as it commences with a basic dyad that eventually implodes upon itself once one recognizes that there is already yin and yang and yang and yin. Already with this trivial example, we see how classical Chinese thought rejects at the level of its most basic concepts, stark identities and strict oppositions. As such, it permits us to conceive of nature, one again, once again, not reality or being with a capital B, conceive of nature, two, ter two terms which gain their meaning through the unfolding of, of representative thought in terms of a stable, excuse me, I, I butchered that sentence, let me begin again. With this trivial example from, from, from the Book of Changes, we see how classical Chinese thought rejected at the level of its most basic concept, concepts, stark identities and strict oppositions. As such, it permits us to conceive of nature in terms of a stable flu fluidity that is ever changing, different from itself, and as such, inimical to the idea that there's a single underlying substance which might be expressed in language once and for all. The purpose of making this brief digression into comparative metaphysics, if we want to call it that, is to argue that the classical Western conception of painting is more complex than Penguin Kai's analysis at times suggests. Western painting's commitment to representation is motivated by more than just the fact that it was for a large part of its history a technical craft carried out by anonymous craftspersons. Representational painting stems from a series of metaphysical assumptions, according to which it is the nature of both concepts and images to represent the being of reality and the reality of being. For most of its history, representational painting inhabits a place within Western culture that is analogous to the sciences. It is practiced not as a means of expression, but as a way of attempting to establish reality at a glance. For the purposes of comparison with the relationships at work within the Chinese brush and ink, however, we must note that the order of representation is constituted by a gap and characterized by a separation from life. Whether it is articulated as the difference between the signifier and the signified, or Plato's distinction between the sensible and intelligible realms, Representation must separate itself from reality and, and then mend that wound by pointing to it. Think of it like this. If painting represents reality, this means that it is not itself enmeshed in that reality. The goal of representation, however, is to carry, carry us across these divides and to bring us into contact with the real. Since the age of Plato, Pla beauty is the name that has been reserved for those representations that usher us, across, us, usher us across this sensible intellectual divide, thereby moving us to appreciate the distance between the real and its representation. 
And since Plotinus, these beautiful representations have been conceptualized as beautiful forms, morphe. As you have guessed, the form achieves this transition between the realms of sense and thought, the sensible and the intellectual, because it is itself at once sensible and intelligible. This is why, to this day, many art theorists are frustrated by the notion of form. Is it sensible or intellectual? Where precisely is it present in the work? Our conceptions of form can tend towards the ideal, in the case of Platonism, or the material, as with an Aristotelian framework, but in any event, making art is said to consist of imposing a form upon recalcitrant matter, or to put it, to put it more metaphysically, in subjecting reality to the good work of form. This conception of art is what I refer to as the formed matter conception of art. Historically speaking, its primary spokesperson was Aristotle, and as we see at a glance, it is a notion of art which that appears to have been derived from the art or craft of making sculpture. What is significant here is that at the level of fundamental assumptions, it is a notion of art that prescribed any and all notions of creativity. Making art for Aristotle is a process that is directed by what his physics describes as the formal and final causes. Artistic form is itself the coming to be of the formal and final causes, which together deliver over the over the genesis of the work to the end for which it was intended, its final cause and the archetype or cultural pattern, the formal cause upon which it is based. What I'm attempting to make clear is that with the formed matter conception of art, the idea of work, the idea of the work rules over its production from beginning to end. There is simply no room for individual expression, happy accidents or other ideas that have become associated with the notion of creativity. So I realize that this, you know, maybe to non-specialist might sound like a, um, a complicated point or uh, might not be fully intelligible. So what I'm saying here is that what the formed matter concept of art, um, the kind of create creation that the formed matter conception of art gives rise to is one wherein the art making process is directed in advance by the idea of what the thing should be and the function for which it's intended. So Aristotle in his physics gives the example of a sculpture that is intended to um, inhabit a temple and be an object of worship. And this is, um, the sculptor has before his mind all of the um, various um, prefigurations of that particular sculpture, the, the ideas, the cultural prototypes of, of what what that sculpture should look like. So it's a very um, idea concept directed way of making art. And the idea um, for Aristotle is that one imposes a concept on matter, like matter is this, um, is this recalcitrant substance that needs to be formed in some way. And so my point is that this isn't really creativity in the way that we will come to understand it in the age of aesthetics. There are many ways in which we might single out the foreign matter conception of art and subject to, to criticism. However, for our purposes here, we need only attend to the way in which this concept of art removes art from the domain of life, thereby erecting it as a type of ideal. Understood as a beautiful form, the work of art is designed to transport us from the domain of the senses into the realm of ideas. For, for Plotinus, for example, the artwork's material properties can be understood simultaneously as an intellectual unity and as such as an idea. Considered from the vantage point of representation, here understood not as a particular function of painting, but as the governing rationality that shaped the West's approach to painting, the work of art thus leads a dual existence. It is at once a sensible particular and a timeless ideal. From this tension springs the notion that painting is capable of capturing things as they are in terms of their essence. However, the price to be paid for this idea that art is capable of capturing and expressing things as they are in their essence will be art itself, a fate which Hegel recognized only belatedly when he pronounced the death of art. When commenting on Leonardo da Vinci's sketches, Julien, for example, laments the fact that for the West, the work of art is no longer a part of becoming. It is firmly anchored in being. As I hope to have shown, being located in being 
is for art tantamount to death in as much as being with a capital B is in the end as it was in the beginning, the concept which designates everything that is separated from and set against life. While the Western concept of art gives rise to a profound and unresolvable tension between art and life, one which has at times been generative of new artistic forms and practices, Chinese brush and ink has tended in the opposite direction. Its practitioners understand painting as part of life and the conduit for the transformation of the basic life energy, qi. Inasmuch as the classical Chinese language does not give rise to the idea that there's a single underlying truth of being, classical Chinese thought has been able to avoid the idea that it needs to capture that reality in words and concepts. Painting was likewise freed up from the idea that it must capture the real that reality in images. Instead, brush and ink intervenes in the common life energy that circulates between the world, the painter, and the viewer, all the while refusing to acknowledge these separations. When considered from the Taoist point of view, the work of art is that which is already immersed within the transfers of the vital life energy. Whereas Western thought separates art from life and then sets it up as form, the Taoist practice of painting regards paper, silk, and ink as the basic elements of life. In painting, what we witness is the exchange that takes place between these materials, the life force of the individual artist, and the dynamic happening of life more generally. Perhaps we can sum up the adventure that takes place in brush and ink by invoking the Taoist idea that art is nothing more than a temporary instantiation, and, I, and I'm stressing this, a temporary instantiation of Jing. In classical texts from this tradition, Jing describes an quote, energetic formation, one wherein the dynamism inherent in matter is momentarily halted by another more superior force in its process of arriving at what it will have been. So the idea here is that everything is in motion and in tension with, with one another and um, that the artist intervenes within these flows of energies and, and halts them through, through, uh, through, an imposing, through, through an opposing force. In short, Jing is the name for the controlled concretization of an otherwise uncontrolled energy. On the basis of this idea, we can once again distinguish between the practice of brush and ink and the form-oriented approach to painting at issue during the classical period of Western culture. In the case of the latter, form dominates the genesis and creation of the work from start to finish, since it is present at the outset as both formal and final cause. Russian ink, on the other hand, arrives at something like a form, and I'm stressing that it's only analogous, it's not a form, that is Jing, only by staging a contestation of forces in and through the work itself. Jing is, the outcome of this play of forces, not something which guides it in advance as an idea. Focusing our account of artistic produ production on the notion of Jing, we should see brush and ink as just that, the place where brush does battle with ink, once they have been mastered and subdued by the superior force of the artist. And here you could bring in Pangun Kai's analysis of the force that the artist must exercise over himself in the attainment of the virtues in order to become master of, of brush and ink. The notion of Jing allows us to see the end result, the so-called finished product of art as the essential moment within a confrontation of forces and the key moment in which force is stabilized. Unlike the form matter concept of art, a conception of art that subordinates pra the practice of art to the idea the Taoist model situates art making alongside of the elemental processes of life, most notably moments of movements of breath, the movements of breath that will give shape to these opposing forces. Conclusion, brief conclusion. Inasmuch as Western metaphysical thought was founded upon a series of stark oppositions, such as the one between the sensible and the intelligible realm it cannot help but think of artistic creation as creation ex nihilo. The Taoist model, on the other hand, enables us to describe creation as a process of continuous engendering. Creativity on this account is not creation in the absolute sense. 
It is a process whereby the artist transforms his materials by attending to their inherent dispositions. According to this model, the artist probes materials in order to find the tensions within them. He exploits their combinations and stretches them to their limits. In the end, we might be forced to say that the brush and ink artist is the, simply the one who lets things happen, since in framing the process, he merely sets in motion the circulation of forces. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph, for this very you know, informative and thought-provoking presentation. We'd like now to invite uh, Professor Kate Ling Lee to provide some comments. And Joseph, you can actually stay you can stay on camera so we can see if you want, right? Okay, and then I'd like to remind our audience to please use the Q&A forum, not the chat forum, to post your questions that we will, you know, uh, start presenting to uh, Professor Tanki and Kate Lingley after Professor Lingley finishes. So, Kate? Thanks, uh, thanks Ming Bao. And thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for that really interesting paper. Um, I'm uh, to some extent in a similar position to Joseph in that I am also working outside of my area of specialty here, um, particularly as the um, so historic turn in art history in the last couple of decades has really meant that there are uh, fewer bridges, I think, being built between art and philosophy, which I think is a shame. Uh, but I can only uh, respond to this as an art historian. So, uh, so with every, everyone's patience, I will do that um, and hope I can do justice to a lot of some of these uh, very interesting ideas. Um, so uh, my initial sense when I sort of heard about the topic of this was, you know, why, uh, why compare Chinese painting and Western painting at all? Uh, you know, why not just let them be kind of their two different things? And obviously, Professor Tanki's paper has given us a good a good answer to that question in that there are some things that we can learn from the comparison. Um, but uh, one of the things that struck me was uh, in in a version of this paper that I uh, that I read before this event um, was that. Uh, Professor Tanki cited James Elkins, who's a, a contemporary art historian, um, who points out that a lot of Euro-American viewers lack the trained eye to even see what's actually going on in a classical Chinese ink painting. Um, and uh, this is actually a kind of ongoing problem <coughs> in my discipline. Um, and I think it's the problem to which Pan Gongkai is, is responding. Um, in fact, the... Uh, the academic study of art in China in the 20th and 21st centuries has really treated as central these kind of questions about how to define the uniquely Chinese character of Chinese painting aesthetics, um, alongside kind of a need to show that Chinese painting has a greatness equal to Western European painting, despite their differences. And I think this has to do, it's very much sort of imbricated with the history of China's emergence onto the world stage in the 20th century. and. Um, its feelings, I think, often rightly so, that it was not being taken seriously enough. Um, I'm assuming in thinking about this that by classical Western painting, Pan means the realist tradition that got started in classical Rome and then blossomed alongside the study of anatomy and optics and other science in the early modern period, what we would at one point have called the Renaissance. <laughs> Um, classical Chinese painting is a little easier to define since it's fairly clear that he means literati ink painting, but I kind of had to do that to get my brain around which, which paintings in particular were being talked about. And there is in fact a very long history of the two traditions kind of talking past each other. Um, Jesuits at the late Ming and early Qing court, some of whom were trained painters in the Mannerist tradition of their time, um, described Chinese painting as clumsy and lacking in a sense of perspective. While the great uh, plum blossom painter Zhou Yigui famously dismissed Western painters from the category of artists entirely when he wrote that, and this is a translated quote, students of painting may well take over one or two points from them to make their own paintings more attractive to the eye. Uh, but those painters have, but these painters have no brush manner whatsoever. Although they possess skill, they are simply artisans. The word here is jiang and cannot consequently be classified as painters. So, <laughs> That doesn't really bode very well for the future of comparative studies, right? But beyond the fact that this encounter produced a certain amount of enjoyable snark, um, especially from the Chinese painters, 
the utter failure of either side to understand the other at first suggests that the differences between them are deep and fundamental and may well reach, as Joseph has pointed out, to the level of philosophy and cosmology. I'm sympathetic to Pan's position since I too have spent my career being expected to defend the value of the study of Chinese art to the mainstream of my discipline, which even now is screamingly Eurocentric. Um, so there was that quote from James Elkins about the, the difficulty uh, of training's one, training one's eye to perceive uh, Chinese painting. There's two other examples I can think of from an article um, by the great James Cahill. Um, he recounts how the eminent art historian Ernst Gombrich took the existence of painting manuals, which taught the painting of orchids stroke by stroke, um, as evidence that Chinese painting was about, quote, complete reliance on acquired vocabulary. Right? The subtext here is no creation is involved and that the value of a painting was in its execution. Um, and as Cahill observed, painting thus becomes a kind of performance art. Um, Arthur Danto, another great in the field, misread a line of an essay by Sherman Lee and assumed that Chinese painting hadn't changed at all since the 13th century, thus uh, marveling at a tra tradition so stagnant that it saw no innovation over a time span, quote, from Giotto to Gauguin, right? Neither of these is a fair assessment, let me just say. <laughs> Um, neither Gombrich nor Danto, who were within their own kuleana, sensitive and perceptive viewers, had the first idea how to look at Chinese painting. But more importantly, both were quite comfortable with the assumption that what they couldn't see wasn't there. So the point is that art history um, is a discipline that has long been comfortable with its own, I would say, sometimes fairly parochial blinders. Uh, Gombrich, by the way, wrote a, a book called The Story of Art, which was published in 1950. And um, a summary of it that I read recently uh, talks about how the central chapters of the book concentrate on Central Europe and then, and then the summary says, and in the last three chapters, he adopts a more global viewpoint because he includes England, France, and America. So uh, you can see where we're at. <laughs> um, advocates for the value of other great art traditions, not just the Chinese, have often found themselves forced to use the language and the theory which art history developed for Western European art. To get, at, to get the art establishment to take those other traditions seriously. And that too, I think, is part of the context for Pangong Kai's project. Um, of course, if you're gonna try to value a part of Chinese art history in terms that will be legible to a narrowly Euro-American interlocutor, classical Chinese literati painting is a good choice, not least because it comes with a well-articulated theory that is recorded in written texts. And this is in this, it is unlike many other art practices from pre-modern China. We know basically nothing about the sculptors of Buddhist, uh, of Buddhist figures, for example. We know very little about, uh, there's more known about the theories of architecture, but you know, there's a lot of, there are art traditions in China that we don't have this kind of information for, but literati theory, you know, the literati wrote about everything, so. Um, and uh, so this makes it easier to position literati painting as an analog for this so-called classical Western painting. Um, and both traditions belonged to social elites, um, although quite different elites in each case. And, and I'm gonna try and frame a question in, uh, uh, about this issue. Um, the problem comes when or if the comparison comes to stand for something essential to each side, an essential Chineseness versus an essential Europeanness. And I wanna emphasize that's not what Professor Tenki is doing here nor I suspect is Pangong Kai. Um, but such essentializing efforts do lurk in the background when comparative studies like this are attempted. Um, and that's where the problems come in. Um, uh, one of the questions we always want to ask ourselves about literati painting is, should we take the literati's word for what they're actually doing? Um, you know, there's a, the, the literati ideal as a kind of model of personhood, again, as, as has been quite clearly articulated, um, ends up being uh, acted out in practice in a lot of really, a lot of really different ways. If you think about, um, I can just think of recent scholarship by Craig Clunas, um, who looks into uh, painters of the Ming dynasty and has shown that there are a lot of ways in which the actual lives of really kind of echt literati painters often challenge the literati ideal. They're, you know, growing um, vegetables in their formal gardens and selling them on the marketplace or whatever. There's a lot of a lot of that kind of thing. Um, 
so at least in my own field, when we talk about literati painting, uh, we feel, or I feel like we have to try to be a little cautious about whether what we see in the art actually accords with the ideal, um, which is being framed to explain it. Um, you know, the influence of literati theory on collecting means that certain things were preserved when so many others were, were discarded. Um, I think Pan Gongkai and, and Professor Tanki are right um, to point to Taoism as the kind of un, one of the underliers of the theory behind literati painting, but um, it's prob I would argue that there's a little bit of Chan Buddhism in there as well. And the problem there is that Chan painting was uh, denigrated by later critics and discarded such that Chan painting from China pretty much only, su only survives in Japan, in Japanese collections now. Um, so the sort of his historical incidentals that mean things get left out and historical incidentals that, um, that influence what gets kept in the story of literati painting. Um, the other in sort of utterly incidental thing is the influence of uh, Dong Qichang on the Qing Orthodox painters. Um, and then of Wang Yunqi, one of those painters on, as advisor to the Kangxi emperor, thereby shaping imperial collecting in the Qing dynasty, which then shapes the, our understanding of, you know, our sort of modern understanding of classical Chinese painting. Um, so there's basically realities and historical incidentals that kind of complicate the narrative of literati painting, um, even as the idea itself is, is relatively well developed and, and worth studying in its own right. Um, I suspect some of the same objections can be leveled at the ideal uh, of classical Western painting and its theory. You know, we, again, European thought wasn't unitary either, of course, and closer examination finds sort of many wonderfully weird departures. I'm sort of thinking of the cheese and the worms, um, the story of this Italian miller who had a really wacky theory of the universe, universe which he seems to have sort of come up to on his own. So uh, my inclination would be to try to complicate the discussion, although, again, I'm not sure that uh, I'm in a position to do that very productively. And indeed, that's not all there is to it, or Professor Tanki wouldn't have found such rich ground for inquiry here. Um, each of the two painting practices, pan contrasts, is of course a specialized subset of a much broader artistic tradition. Um, and each is connected to a theoretical and or philosophical tradition. And it's undeniably interesting to consider how the relationship between art making and ideas about the nature of reality, of existence, of human experience and expression um, were built into such different contexts. So here's my question or kind of food for further thought. Um, so both of these forms of painting and their related philosophical contexts are connected through certain members of social elites who had the education to access both. Similarly, in both cases, the philosophies in question were founded in antiquity. So remember that the classical Athenian philosophers and the philosophical masters of the warring states were rough contemporaries um, and then elaborated through centuries of commentary. Um, so there's some really strong parallels, um, but there are also some significant differences. And the one I wanna hone in on is um, the question of who were the painters, right? European intellectual elites, which for me is kind of a, a what I mean by that is the people who were, who were um, doing the philosophy, if that's, sorry, um, were rarely painters and the political and church elites who patronized much classical Western painting were also not painters. Uh, you know, the, the people who did the painting and the people who did the philosophy were, were really separate. And you see that contracts between patrons and artists in the 15th and 16th centuries often specified how much gold and costly ultramarine pigment should be used in a painting how much the hand of the master as opposed to his apprentices should be involved. Um, but they weren't typically articulated in terms of the relationship between being and representation. At the same time, it was a small step from the mixing of pigments to alchemy and the early modern interest in optics, anatomy, optical perspective did connect very strongly to philosophy at a time when the lines between kind of what we think of now as fields of study, right? History, philosophy, science, weren't yet hard and fast. Um, but 
by contrast, the painters who produced Chinese literati brush painter painting were exactly the people who were also articulating the contemporary understandings of the relationship between the artist and his art, between representation and direct experience. The painters were the philosophers. And when we think about um, this question of the relationship between the artwork and reality in both uh, traditions, um, I think of the famous quotation from the theorist Dong Qi Chang, a Ming, a Ming theorist and painter. Um, who basically said, if your interest is in variety and, uh, and you know, different kinds of experience, then real landscape is for you. But when you think of the remarkable power of brush and ink, there's nothing to compare to a painted landscape. So Dong Qi Chang is actually articulating this idea that there are some contexts in which the painted landscape is better than the, than the real life landscape. Um, and for many of the reasons that I think Professor Tenki has led has left out. Uh, sorry, not left out, laid out. I'm <laughs> sorry about that, Joseph. Um, so my question is, I wonder, I wonder whether, to what extent, this kind of different relationship between the artist and the philosopher um, shapes might shape our understanding of the ideas that Pangongkai has articulated, and that you, Professor Tenki, have elaborated. And I will shut up there, and we can have a discussion. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you, Professor Lingli, for such insightful comments and questions. So I think we should give uh, Professor Tanki an opportunity to respond to the question comment first. And then after that, we'll go into our Q&A you know, sessions. We have a couple of questions from the audience, right? But uh, Professor Tanki should have an opportunity first to respond to Professor Kingley's comments. Okay. Uh, just, well, thank you for that, Kate. I'll just say very quickly that I'm not claiming that these philosophers, or that, that, that these artists were, you, I think, first I'll just start by agreeing with what you said that in, in the case of the literati, um, the connection between art and philosophy is much closer, right? Like for, for the reasons you point out that they're, um, that they're the actual thinkers, they're producing the, the art theory for their practice. Um, whereas in the West, that's not happening. But my claim um, about the relationship between art and these deeper philosophical assumptions in this context is not so much that, oh, these artists are reading this theory and then that then they're producing a certain type of work. It's that these linguistic assumptions which frame our culture in a very, very fundamental and broad way are manifest in the work. Almost, mm -hmm. it's almost like the, the unconscious from which they're operating, right? And so in the, in the West, our, the, I, my claim is that I think is, is quite humble, is that the conception of being that we've had, which stems from the assumptions in the Greek language um, about, about how, how being is, is situated in relationship to other entities uh, and other aspects of reality, it forms, a, forms, forms in advance of the practice of art a certain idea of what art is and what it should be doing. And it's from there that we get the idea that that painters get the idea that that art art should be as mimetic as possible, right? As representational mm -hmm. as possible. Pan's claim is is actually that the reason why these guys are so concerned with it, he he's reproducing the same old um, snark that you quoted at the beginning. His argument <laughs> is actually maybe a little bit um, nastier than I make it, uh, make it out to be here. It's that the reason why they're, they're so concerned with um, the, the illusionistic representation of reality is because they're mere craftspeople. And this is the way in which they can outdo one another. When you were talking about, um, you know, in, in, in each case that these are the elites within a culture, I was wondering how much that's true within the European context. And of course, we'd have to go country by country to, to sort this out. But the, the context I'm most familiar with is that of Spain because of my interest in Foucault and then my interest in Las Meninas. And we know that in the case of Velasquez, um, you know, who's the court painter, that he was only introduced into the, the royal order and thus seen as something more than just a craftsperson only posthumously. So the little insignia that he carries on his, um, on his uh, shirt in, in Las Meninas was put there two years after his death, after um, Philip IV accorded him, you know, this status. So I think, you know, this is the, the idea that 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 
the painters are intellectuals um, or, and the painters are, you know, have an elite social function comes at comes later within the Western tradition and at different rates in different countries. It's probably like Italy is probably a little more advanced um, in, in this regard, right? The, you know, with the being the home of the Renaissance and, and, and the like. But again, my claim is not that, um, that we see them, you know, reading a text by Descartes and on the optics or something like this and saying, okay, what we're going to do now is, is directly present reality. It's my, my, my claim is no, more that yes. these fundamental assumptions, these a priori form our experience for us in certain ways and lead in certain direction. And I, and I agree with you. I hope that it didn't sound like I, I didn't, um, you know, in terms of, well, two things. In terms of the status of uh, elites in um, in Europe, I really was thinking more of the patrons and you know sort of people who commission painting, but not but not specifically not the painters. I mean, some of them had high status, but not it wasn't sort of a a, a done deal. Um, but I also want to say that I think I agree with uh, your suggestion that this uh, these ideas form a kind of underlying um, matrix for, you know, what people are actually doing. Uh, and the thing that, um, that makes me feel this at a very gut level is the extent to which in the present day, my students are insistent on seeing art as a development, a developmental process of my nieces, right? People are getting better at representing reality. And I have to do a lot of work in teaching to, disassemble that idea. So I think, uh, you know, ultimately, I'm, I'm with you here. <laughs> I come at it from a different approach. But I think, you know, this idea that these ideas that these concepts are so fundamental. Um, and I think the, I, I have to say, kind of hegemony of European thought in the discipline of art history means that I get it from students who come from China as well, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard to unpack. Um, I, I, so to maybe just respond uh, and make it our, our discussion a little more nuanced, I think, yeah, the, I think that if the patrons that you're talking about are the elites, of, they're the ones who want the representational illusionistic art. And this is part mm -hmm. of what's driving forward the process in part because they don't yet have very sophisticated tastes, right? They have, they have right. money, but they're kind of Philistines at the same, at the same time, right? So they just like what what looks most like reality, and they're they're predisposed to go to those crafts people who can get the job done in the best possible way. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part that's of the, the, that's part of the standard narrative in in Western art history, anyways. I want to ask you a question, though, if we have a um, a minute. Um, you mentioned about the influence of Chan Buddhism, uh, and 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 I'm curious where you see that in. You, you, uh, to clarify, do you see that as influencing the literati paintings that I'm talking about, or yes? I, so how does that happen? Right. Okay. And <laughs> I see. I see your point. Um, so it is certainly it's it's a pretty well agreed on sort of truism in the general narrative of Chinese painting history that Chan painting was sort of present at and participated in the formation of the literati style in the Song period, okay. um, particularly in the Southern Song period, because Chan painting developed with certain stylistic characteristics, which were you know, evocative of, or at least kind of congruent with the values of, um, of Chan Buddhism. So um, ink monochrome as a, an appropriate um, medium for uh, a sect of Buddhism that emphasized austerity and simplicity, um, the use of paper rather than silk, same thing, um, the simplicity of composition, um, the looseness of style. Uh, I can send you some images later if you want to see what I'm what I mean by that, and um, uh, and the the adoption of a kind of style which could easily be mastered by an amateur because that's part of the thing part of the kind of core idea of the literati painter is that he is an amateur and not a professional even as in fact you, we see that many literati painters were very very much not amateurs in the sense of having tremendous mastery of their of their craft um, but the kind of the idea that the 
that the emphasis should be on the expressive qualities of the art and not a kind of visual, a kind of visible cultivation of skill. Um, is, is those are the things that are all all seem to be really core to Chan painting, um, but the critics of the UN saw it as coarse and crude, mm. and kind of wrote all those painters off, and as a result of which they were not collected past the Song period, even as these same characteristics become um, pretty central to the literati painting ideal mm. going forward into the UN. I, I appreciate that. I'm I, and I'm really grateful for that explanation. Um, I'm going to think more about how I can incorporate that into this this narrative. I always feel like Chan Buddhism and Taoism are kind of kissing cousins in China, anyway. So, of, of course, yeah, in, in the philosophical world as well. And so that that makes perfect sense. So you see it particularly in the Southern Song Dynasty, but that the in the Yuan period, it's sort of cast out, even though yeah. it's already left its mark on the painting tradition. Yeah, and religious painting kind of returns to the realm of the professionals, and then there's an influx in the UN of Himalayan influence for sort of hopefully obvious reasons. Um, so that so that there's no longer a kind of Buddhist tradition that continues those those great. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Muti's Six Persimmons, um, but this wonderful Chan painting that's in a in a Japanese collection. Um, uh, I think we probably should answer some questions. Otherwise, I would pull it up and show you all. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move on and, no, and I can have a further conversation later. <laughs> okay, we do we do have a couple of, you know, we have actually two comments and two questions, but you know, we can always, you know, I think it's so interesting just listening to you two exchanging these ideas. We can maybe return to it later. But let me start with the first comment that we received. It's by uh, Li Lunding. It's very grateful for this dialogue. I've asked many Chinese artists which philosophy, Confucianism, Buddhism, or Taoism helped them unleash their creative energy. They unequivocally said Taoism. Oh, these good. Artists, Thank you. <laughs> these, artists, these artists are not necessarily ink and brush painters like Mr. Pan Gung Kai. They are mostly multimedia conceptual artists who sometimes incorporate ink into their work. So any one of you wants to respond to that? Um, the question of contemporary art um, and to what extent uh, brush and ink can still be viewed as a contemporary art or the way in which it might fit on the contemporary landscape is something that Pengun Kai and I are both very interested in. He um, does these, Pengun Kai does very traditional brush and ink painting, but he also does um, conceptual art, multimedia um, installations where um, um, you kind of are immersed in the brush and ink painting and the ink forms around you on, on, on visual screen, vi video screens. He's done video installations, which look like, you know, like those traditional Chinese um, paintings of Chinese villages, which are not so common, but you know, we have several, you know, we have a tradition of this as well, not just, not just landscapes, but um, water and tree paintings, but we, we have uh, water and rock paintings. We also have, um, villages and he, he recreates these um, iconic images uh, from the Chinese tradition as huge video installations where people are moving through the village and stuff like that. And they're, they're, I mean, they're mesmerizing and amazing works. But I think that's a very important question is how do we think of this art form which is still being practiced in the way, setting aside those other examples, how do we think of this art form, brush and ink, which is still being practiced in the contemporary period, right. as part of uh, you know the, our world heritage, our our, our global civilization, right? Um, it it doesn't exactly fit with the currents of contemporary art, but you know these are still contemporary artists, right. and so I, I um, I'm very I, and I think that it's through theory. And because of its intimate connection with theory, as Kate was saying, right, that these artists were, since, since antiquity, were also theoreticians, which has now become incumbent upon artists in the Western tradition, contemporary artists, that they also be in some way conversant in art theory. I think this is one way in which we make the case that even this seemingly antiquated traditional art form, brush and ink, um, is a contemporary art. And, and I would want it to, I want it to be seen that way. Mm -hmm. Kate, do you want to? Yeah. Well, if any if anybody here has um, remembers the exhibition of uh, Li Huayi, 
at the Honolulu Museum uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, that was, a, I think, a great example of how ink landscape can be powerfully contemporary. Um, and, and there's also the issue that art, which is, you know, whatever art is being done now is contemporary art. So, you know, <laughs> we may have to also broaden our, our, our scope there. But I guess what I would add here is that, um, you know, the sort of, there are a lot of things that happen for the first time in Western painting in the modern period, which were already really well established in, um, in Chinese painting for, right. you know, seven, 800 years by that point, including, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a, a great um, uh, romantic painting by Caspar David Friedrich called The Monk by the Seashore. And the big deal is that it's supposed to represent sort of the uh, the concept of the sublime because the monk in the sea in the painting is looking out to sea and not looking at us um, and the idea that the figure in a landscape painting represents the viewers or the artist's subjectivity in contemplating the landscape is like goes back to the northern song dynasty at the at at least <laughs> you know and and similarly you know the idea that the artist should be a theorist mm -hmm. um, the idea that art is not primarily about representation, but is about expression. Um, you know, there's all these kinds of, I, there's a lot of ideas which seemed really novel and revolutionary in the Western canon, which, uh, you know, maybe some of that snark was a little justified, right? They're not, that, they're not really news in China. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it, that's maybe one of the reasons why it seems, um, why uh, Taoism and the kind of art theory that comes along with it seem really um, uh, still very viable to um, contemporary artists, contemporary Chinese artists in a way that, you know, theories of optics and kind of Aristotelian ideas about representation maybe might not feel so resonant to contemporary Western artists, even as, you know, they may still be floating around in the ether if you see, if, uh, you see what I mean? Right. Great. Okay, so we have a question here from Jiang Hong, who's a professor of uh, geography here at UH Manoa. She says, um, Professor Tanki, great presentation. I wonder if you could say a bit about the influence of Zhuangzi, right, on Chinese art and, and painting, in particular, the role of removing desires in meditation. Zhuangzi held a radical distrust on human categories and language, thus representation. Well, I'd be I'd be interested to hear um, more about her suggestion on in that regard. I, I um, to what the, on the on the, specifically on the question of desire um, or just to, someone who knows um, knows the you know that knows the Chinese philosophical tradition better than I do um, to mm -hmm. speak on that question. To what extent is or maybe Kate has some thoughts on to what extent is the cessation of desire an integral part of the literati personhood ideal? My, my intuition would probably say, well, it depends on what period we're talking about and it depends on um, how heavily, how heavy the Buddhist influences are at, at that mm. time or not. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, thinking about the traditional traditional virtues and wondering how much they're about suppressing desire uh, and as much as, or, or rather the, uh, are they about forming desire, channeling desire and making sure that there are, that desire is manifest and articulated in the right way, right? Desire for um, um, right conduct um, as opposed to other types of desires. So. I, I, I really don't know. I, I'm thinking about it for the first time and I'd be curious to hear what other people say. Mm -hmm. okay. there is a, there's a late Tang theorist called Guo Xi, uh, sorry, late Tang sort of early Song theorist called Guo Xi, who's one of the great early um, monumental landscape painters. And um, I think it's him. I'm gonna ha I would have to go back and check this, but I'm pretty sure he's the one who, who says this. He talks about how the artist should approach painting a landscape. Um, and you know the the Northern Song monumental landscape painters did think that the artist should go out and look at mountains before painting them, um, which uh, you know was a greater or lesser part of the artist's of the painter's practice in different periods. But um, he basically says that the if I'm getting this right that the artist should contemplate 
um, should contemplate nature, contemplate the mountain, contemplate nature with, uh, with the heart of the mountains, like from a kind of perspective that belongs to nature itself and not from a personal perspective, from, a, from the, I think he, what he means is the perspective of Qing, right? Sort of personal sentiment. Um, that if he, you know, if he looks at it from his own individual personalized perspective, then what he paints will be sort of narrow and, and cramped. But if he regards nature with the heart of the mountains and the trees, then he will be able to kind of encompass in his painting this sort of more, I think, more cosmic qu um, quality. So uh, that there's many things in that idea embedded in that, but one of them is the idea that you have to, if you're a Northern Song Mon monumental landscape painter, you have to kind of set your own personal uh, reactions aside and try to achieve a kind of reaction which is more universal. Um, and Southern Song painters tend to paint these landscapes which are highly personal and interior and, and intimate. Um, thinking of Shun, oh, I can't remember the guy who's meditating by candlelight, Never mind. But, um, you know, it's a very different approach. So I think you might tie some of that to Zhuangzi, the sort of, uh, and to some kinds of Buddhism, the kind of like, do we bring, what's the role of the self in, right. uh, in, in painting? Mm -hmm. Our next question, I think also Gets, gets to that whole issue. It's from Jing Liu. It says, right, while Western philosophy revolves around being, the experience of non-being is the salient feature of Taoism and Zen. Can you highlight the influence of this peculiar experience in Chinese art? Well, it's, it's rather broad, right? But either I think either of you, if you have any comments, quick thoughts on that. Well, hmm. Jing, I thought that's what I was trying to do in my in my talk was trying to um, articulate the ways in which in in um, I think like that already that articulation of being and non being is to bias it in terms of the Western right that's my intuition I'm not a I'm not a specialist on the Chinese text in the way that you are but um, I think already that that expression is um, to slant it and, and put it in the Aristotelian framework. And so to stop talking about being and non-being in terms of these absolutes, but rather to talk about nature in all of its different manifestations, and then to talk about absences and plays of forces is in my reading at, at, at the very least um, more, more specific um, to, the, to the Chinese tradition. So, so I, I, I guess I'm trying to, to give play to um, the thought of non-being, but not not as such, right? Because that's already, you know, with imbricated within the whole Aristotelian framework, and you know, we can talk from there about the problem of nihilism and all of this. But because um, it, it arises from there, uh, from the failure to really think um, to think non-being in its um, in its specificity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. <laughs> okay, so we only have, we have one anonymous comment. Um, it's not that well phrased. The person apologizes for that, but I think it gets to a point, uh, it, it addresses a point that Kate actually began her comments with, which is about the bridge between art and philosophy, right? I remember you began your comments about that, that there is this gap, right? And then this comment also asked about, you know, I think it's again, maybe taking, taking off on the comment you made that, you know, understanding Chinese or brush and ink painting is not very well understood. And is there any ways to sort of bridge that gap or make that under, or improve that understanding? So this is how I understand this. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, so, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I, there's kind of two approaches, one of which is to learn painting learn Chinese painting and the other of which is to study Chinese art history. And I think they bring you to actually slightly different understandings of uh, Chinese painting because when you are learning to do Chinese painting, then you have, um, uh, you're learning a practice which is all happening in the, in the present moment. And so while you'll doubtly, doubtless be learning things that are drawn from various parts of history, Chinese ink painting is a tremendously historically conscious practice. Right. Um, they nevertheless have to be kind of integrated into a current practice. And of course, you know, ink painting 
is um, at least, I mean, the earliest ink paintings we have that survive are from the Warring States period. So at least 23, 2400 years of ink painting, you know, you wouldn't imagine that there aren't some contradictory things that happened during that time. You couldn't possibly sum it all up in a modern practice. So if you're interested in the way these ideas change over time, like I mentioned the change from Northern Song to Southern Song landscape, the different um, sense of what the role of the artist's own subjectivity is. That's, I think, a really interesting contrast. Um, then I think studying Chinese art painting history is um, a better approach. And although it's a little out of date now, I think you can't go too far wrong if you start with the work of James Cahill, mm -hmm. um, who is really probably the greatest uh, Western language scholar of Chinese painting of the 20th century, and who did a lot to both represent, to try to both represent Chinese painting um, fairly and accurately, um, and also to kind of uh, blow out of the water some of the assumptions, you know, including the assumption that we have to take the literati at their word for everything they're actually doing, um, <laughs> as well as, you know, kind of Western assumptions about um, how Chinese painting, for example, didn't change since the 13th century, which is absurd. Um, so, so James Cahill, I think, would be a good place to start. Joseph, do you have anything to add? Um, on the question of how to situate the relationship between art and philosophy or art history and philosophy, there are many different ways to do this. Um, and I, I don't know of, of, um, of only one that's, 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 well, I would say I do know of one that, that's, that's a particularly good way to do it. And that would be um, through the lens of aesthetics, by which I mean um, aesthetics, for, since its inception is an interdisciplinary um, framework. It doesn't belong to philosophy alone. It, it's situated at the intersection of the new sciences of perception and sensation that were going on in Europe at the time. It's in dialogue with um, literary theory, art theory, what the Germans called poetics. Um, it's concerned with ethics because that's what the early British aestheticians were concerned with. And, and, you know, and it's got a strong foothold in, in philosophy as well. And so I think aesthetics is already in between the two as, as I understand aesthetics. And the core concept of aesthetics is the notion of a, it's this notion that judgments of taste ultimately devolve to what Kant calls the free play of the faculties, which amounts to saying that we judge on the basis of a feeling that we share, we, we presuppose, or we hope that we can share universally with others. Without, without having a rule that we can make recourse to. That is to say, we don't have a de de definite principle by which we can say this judgment is correct in the way that we can with um, a judgment such as two plus two is equal to four, or that the, you know, the, shoes are, the shoes are in the living room. We don't have a principle that we can appeal to when we say this is beautiful. We, go on, we judge on the basis of a feeling that we have, which we think others will share and I think this informs the spirit of aesthetics and how we can relate philosophy and art history, philosophy and art. We don't have a definite principle for knowing when we're doing it right. We have a feeling for when we're doing it right. We have a feeling for when the dialogue is fruitful and when it's, it's producing, producing a new knowledge. Right. And so that's, uh, that's my, my response to the question. We have, we don't have much time left, but we actually have an interesting question here from our colleague Franklin Perkins from the philosophy department. He says, uh, in your contrast, you didn't mention the role of Christianity in Western art. Do you think it alters the Aristotelian Arist 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 framework in any relevant ways or not? I'm thinking of the idea that the world, uh, that the world artists represent it, it, that the world the artists represent is self a product of design. And we might even say a representation of an idea in the mind of God. So yeah. Um, well, thanks Frank for the question. And, and, and thank you for not correcting my understanding of, of Taoism and my Chinese pronunciation in public. I appreciate that. Um, it's a good question. Um, what, what, you know, what does Nietzsche say uh, that Christianity is Platonism for the masses? Right. Um, and so I think, I think that um, I would want to know more from you about how you see that idea of the world as creation um, going beyond or breaking from the Aristotelian 
framework that I laid out here. I mean, I'm talking about a Neoplatonic thinker in this text as well. I think Plotinus is really key for how we come to view. Um, Plotinus is obviously very key for the intellectual formation of early Christianity, but he's, he's, he's crucial for how we come to understand the notion of form, artistic form in the West together with um, the way we understand beauty is simultaneously sensible and intellectual and something that ushers us across these barriers and introduces us into the spiritual realm. So in that way, I think I'm, 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 I'm dealing with that, but I'm intrigued by what's, what's lurking in um, the suggestion that um, the created world is already an idea in, the, uh, in God's mind. If we think of that in Aristotelian terms and... Um, as you know, God being the formal, final, material, and efficient cause of everything. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you as to how that would would break with what I'm doing, but I but I'll be curious to hear more from you about that. I'm sure. Okay. Well, um, unfortunately, our time is up. Well, um, and I would like to thank Professor Tanki for his very informative and illuminating presentation, Professor Lingni for her insightful comments. Many thanks as well to the audience for their participation, for the interesting comments and questions. And before everybody leaves, I'd like to remind you that our next event is on February 19th, next week, which is a Friday, not Wednesday, from 12 to 1.30. And it will also be an interdisciplinary faculty dialogue between Professor Wei Zhang from sociology at UH Manoa, who will talk about productive aging, health, and well being among Chinese older adults in conversation with Professor Ian Chu from the psychology department, who will provide some comments and feedback. So, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, particularly, as I said, to Professor Tanki and Professor Lingni for participating, for sharing with us their you know, thoughts on this very exciting topic. I encourage the audience to get in touch with our speakers, their emails, or if you don't know their emails, feel free to contact the Center for Chinese Studies. Right? And hopefully I'll see you all again next week. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, thank, thank you, you Joseph. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> thank you.